good noontide to you. My name is Howard Wig, Hawaii State Energy Office, and the proud host of Code Green, which specializes generally in energy efficient matters. Today, we are going to be talking about a really important topic, tiny homes, homes for the houseless. I think we can all agree that if we had to list all of Hawaii's problems, well, the COVID would probably come number one, but then would come houselessness. And it's not just for the houseless, but very low income people too. Living in paradise is a real, real struggle. I had the good fortune as a youth to be to hitchhike through third world countries. And I would stay in villages just with the grass huts and families all in a small space. And something that taught me was how little material goods you really need. These people were actually healthy and happy in really, really limited uh, spaces and with limited amenities. And that taught me that we Americans don't need two and a half thousand uh, square, square feet of uh, housing and all of the material things we had. So what we really need, and we're gonna be talking about, is community in addition to housing. Gives me great pleasure to have two really distinguished guests here. Constance Mitchell, who is the CEO of IHS, Institute of Human Services, and turns out the instigator of a lot of this type of uh, housing. And you may remember that one of the COVID centers turned out to be IHS, and I don't know how she did it. Connie solved the problem, got people <laughs> isolated. How in the world do you do that? I, I have no idea. So, and then we're going to be joined by James Poo. I, I memorized your name, James Poo Pukele, yeah? Pukele, Something yeah. like that. Anyway, he is the, the head of dynamic community solutions, and they have a real live bustling community on the Waianae coast taking care of a whole lot of people who need taking care of. And I, I think you'll agree with me after seeing this, that all we need to do is multiply these types of communities by a hundred times statewide, and boom, we wouldn't have a houseless problem and people would be able to live safely and securely. So we've got a lot of ground to cover. Miss Connie, why don't you take it over? Hey, Howard, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to this uh, version of uh, Think Tech uh, Hawaii. I'm just really um, excited about sharing some of the things that we've been doing at IHS with Tiny Homes. And, um, you know, and I had met James Perkelly, who is also our guest this uh, morning, um, you know, just from the aspect of trying to learn from him about what they're doing out in Waianae at Pu'ohonua or Waianae, and just kind of incorporating a lot of, um, you know, some of the things that they're doing with what we're doing at IHS too. So anyway, I um, wanted to just go to um, the slide deck that I brought along this morning to just share with you about our, um, exploration of different kinds of um, features that we've used or um, have been given us to use for tiny homes for people. So, you know, we um, really know that these mini homes are a real solution for people who are experiencing homelessness or homelessness. And we've used them for emergency shelter, uh, for transitional or bridge housing, or what we call it, you know, temporarily before they get into permanent housing. And then I've had the good fortune to um, work with some people who are using permanent, um, you know, these smaller structures for permanent housing as well. And then I've been really playing around with the idea of actually using them um, in this time of COVID for isolation. You know, so I just wanted to kind of um, share uh, how we might be able to do that. So the first um, um, experience that we had was using these containers that were retrofitted by the city create um, what is now known as Halemaleola at the Sand Island um, Housing Navigation Center. Halemaleola is, means um, a place uh, of healing. And um, we really wanted it to be so, and we were given these um, containers to work with people. 
but you know it really um, was pretty stark at the beginning and it wasn't until they started doing things together and we have in there like a central hall that is, is not shown exactly over there but there's a place where people come together to do activities to eat together and that was necessary absolutely necessary you know for us to develop a community so that's the first one you know that we use for emergency it was really containers that were retrofitted so they were cut into either three rooms or two rooms depending upon whether we were going to put an ada or a couple's unit in um you know the ones that were cut in half there were 20 foot containers or whether we were going to do um, three uh, individual units for um, single people. We have pets there. We have couples that can stay together. A lot of times when people go to shelters, they're not allowed to stay together. So we used to have to divide them and separate them. Next one that's emergency housing was actually donated by Prometheus Construction. And so Cliff Tillotson um, was gracious enough to share um, these two little houses that he had created. And he really was thinking that he wanted to make some kind of housing that was going to be um, really good for people who were coming in and out of homelessness as well. And so uh, we had that move to Hale Maliola. So it sits in there, you know, along with the other containers. And um, I kind of like created two rooms that look like they're dormitory rooms, you know, for um, college students maybe or something. But they fit, you know, like a bed and a place to eat maybe. And these all are just rooms for people to live in for privacy, but they don't include a bathroom or um, you know, kitchen facilities. We use um, communal kitchen facilities and communal hygiene centers there. Next slide, please. This one is um, transitional housing that we're involved in by the fact that we're providing the services, the, um, the case management services. But it's actually operated by the First Assembly of God and it's called a shelter at Kahanu. So it's really beautiful setting, you know, um, there are these dome structures that are um, also divided on the right side, you see a picture of the way that it's divided inside with actual walls, you know, and these are, of course, larger structures, but really a um, wonderful place for single moms with children, you know, to um, have a place to live. Uh, the families that are coming into this um, community are actually um, had been living in their cars, you know, or um, you know, somewhere else, uh, not meant for uh, human habitation. And it's really a great opportunity for people and they have the uh, support of a community that is that church. This is our latest, um, you know, addition to Hale Maliola, and this is um, a two-story building that was designed by the Perfect Space and donated um, to IHS at Hale Maliola by Frank Rogers, who was the designer, and you know, it was his brainchild to create. So there's two stories, so it could actually house um, two different households, which we're thinking that we might wanna do that with an external, um, you can't see it here, but there, there would be an external stairway going up and it, it would be provided. So each of them have their own private entrance. And so this is um, another version of you know a um, tiny home, really tiny home, but all of these really have facilities you know that really um you know allow people to have access to the things they need but of course you know it's um not right in their little house next slide mm -hmm. now this one is these are um you know houses that um small houses that were modular in design and um, construction in japan um called komatsu houses and they were used in the um tsunami that had hit um japan many years ago and then now they're being brought back um, you know, to Hawaii to make Kahawiki Village, which is a village of, it's going to be about 144 um, units of housing um, on this a lot near Sand Island as well. Um, Dwayne Carisu is the one who gathered a team together to develop it. And we are doing the, um, the management of activities for the families there and coordinating you know, a lot of the, um, the different uh, other organizations that come in to do service. So that's been you know there for about a couple of years now and it's been a thriving community and people are really getting to understand what it means to be a part of a community that next slide so that's all my slides actually but it was a segue into um uh, having um jane speak a little bit about what's happening out in waianae i think they are um really done a fantastic job you know bringing people together and challenging them to actually come up with their solution and be a part of the solution to their houses. 
Dr. James Parkelly. So anyway, um, you know, we, we fall under a little bit uh, a different circumstance because we've already, like, we already have the community, right? I'm not, I'm not sure if the, everybody knows, but you know, right next to Wainai Boat Harbor is a Uonua Wainai, which is a community of about 250 people. Um, and the, the, the community has been there for like over a decade. And so, you know, they've, they've been able to, to build this community structure. And, you know, it's something that we've really, that's, to us, that's the gem of the whole thing, right? It's, it's a community. And so we've come up with this idea of, you know, community first, where, uh, you know, they've been able to build this community without any structures. And so, you know, we're coming in with these, uh, you know, the tiny home idea, uh, you know, kind of after the fact and after the, um, after the community has been built. But, you know, that's kind of a benefit to us because we're able to develop with that lived experience and the experience of, you know, this community has been thriving for like over a decade. I don't know if you guys wanna to go to the slides. Uh, yeah, so, okay, that's just the intro slide. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> um, the way that the community is broken down now, it's into uh, several sections. I think there's about between 10 and 12 sections. And each section has a leader. Each section is comprised of about 25 people. And so, you know, they have structured leadership meetings that, you know, occur every Monday and weekly, you know, it depends on, you know, what each, each section, uh, you know, is, is deemed best. They have, you know, weekly meetings within their sections, they have activities within their sections, um, you know, if there's any disagreements or whatever, uh, you know, any questions, anybody need help, they go, you know, within their section or within their section leader. <clears throat> And you know anything that that has to go above, then you know then they go and see Twinkle. <laughs> okay, next slide. Um, you know one of the the things that that Twinkle has done is uh, you know implement this thing where everybody is required to give a certain amount of community service hours every month. Every adult that lives there is required to do community service, and that can you know be either uh, you know as you see here planting planting stuff in Amala. Uh, you see you know you see one individual. Outside, you know, at one point, the, the park next door, the, um, the person that serviced the park, the city and county worker, she retired. And so, you know, they would go across and, you know, cut the grass. Uh, you know, they started these uh, bathroom brigades since the beginning of COVID. And even before that, you know, they were, they were helping to, you know, stop the bathrooms, keep the bathrooms clean. They know the village, uh, you know, the village uses the bathrooms. So you know, they kind of take it kuleana. And they have, you know, donation tent went in where they, you know, they bring in donations, people can come in, people in the village and people from, you know, an outside community because just because they're not, you know, houseless and living, you know, in the village doesn't mean that people aren't struggling. So, uh, you know, they, they really kind of opened the don uh, that donation area. And so, you know, part of community service is people, you know, kind of staffing and, you know, bringing in the donations, going through them and things like that. And, you know, it's really, one of, you know, Twinkle says, you know, you give somebody a little bit of kuleana and it wakes the mana right up. You know what I mean? Makes them feel good. Um, and so it's not only within the village, but they also do outreach to, you know, houses and camps across the island. And so, you know, they, they take, they do feedings, you know, they take, um, they pack up, you know, like hygiene and stuff like that. They go out and a lot of people, you know, a lot of times when they, they go out and they meet with, you know, different encampments from Wahiwa to Crane Park to Diamond Head, um, Waimanalo, all across the island. You know, they, when, when they go out, you know, they kind of meet people and it's, the people are kind of surprised. You know, they ask, like, you know, what, what church are you guys from? What organization? They're like, no, we, we house is just like you guys. You know, but we've been so blessed that, you know, they want to share the blessing with others. And so, you know, that community building really extends beyond, you know, their village. And, you know, it's really been a, a catalyst for, you know, folks in Kaka'ako and Waimanalo to, you know, kind of realize and go, wow, you know, these guys, have, they are where we are and they've done all of these things. And it's really been, you know, a uh, real motivation to, you know, have them step up and, you know, try to, try to get to, you know, to the, to the next level on themselves kind of plays through this. <laughs> okay, uh, this is a rendering. So, um, you know, in 2018, the state started talking about sweeping the village and there's this whole big, you know, hoo -ha, hoo -ha. we ended up meeting with the governor and we asked, you know, we said, hey, just give us time to keep our community together. 
right? Um, we understand, you know, we understand we're on state land, um, but, you know, we value our community and this community has been together for over 10 years. We'll move on our own, on our, you know, just give us the time to, to organize that. And so, you know, I'm, I'm grateful. He agreed to give us the time. And since then, you know, we've raised uh, about a million and a half dollars and purchased a 20 acre property of land up in Wainai Valley. And so we're currently, uh, you know, in the process of preparing that land to relocate 250 people, uh, you know, as much as, as much of them as they want to come uh, up to this new property. And, you know, this time we kind of see, you know, it's, it's some of the benefits and I think, you know, Connie kind of touched on some of those, uh, you know, communal bathrooms, communal kitchens. If you ever try to build a house, you know, you understand that, you know, all the money goes into bathrooms and kitchens. And so anytime you have to deal with a lot of people, um, you know, you kind of go to this communal thing and it's not something, you know, that's new, right? Um, we did it in job court, they do it in the military, they do it in the prison, they do it, um, you know, in college dorms, uh, you know, but they've also done it, you know, Hawaiians uh, historically have, have lived that way for, you know, centuries, centuries, um, you know, so we kind of look back and say, oh, you know, how, how, how did these guys do it? And, you know, and that's, that's kind of what it is. So it, what that does is it really brings down the cost of development, um, you know, it, Having that community there really brings down the, the cost of operations. Uh, you know, there was this one in um, in Kona, I think, and one of their biggest costs were running security. You know, we don't we don't have that cost. Our people run their own security. Um, you know, we don't we don't have a cost for groundskeepers. Our people run there. You know, <laughs> it's it's the village residents that have that you know community service time that actually you know take care of the landscaping, uh, you know, groundskeeping, and you know, kind of anything else that we need. So it, it keeps the development costs down and it keeps the operations costs down. And or just you know reiterating the the idea of you know community first, where you know these guys have been able to build a community even without structures, and so you know at the end of the day you know structures would be nice because you know if you're staying out there in tents, people that don't you know that that don't live that way don't understand. Um, but you know like it's things like when it when it rains. A lot of times you have kids and you know people that work and they have to stay up all night and push out the pockets of water. And if they don't do that, then the water builds up and collapses and gets everything they own wet. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's things like that that make, you know, it's, it's these solid structures really a benefit to the community. And we're trying to get away from, uh, you know, from that, having to deal with that type of thing. You know, winds come through, they, they wreck the tents, everybody has, you know, you have to buy it all over and stuff like that. So, um, but, you know, the, the focus here is on, on the community and the value of the community, both, you know, as, as, uh, as an individual person and, you know, as, as keeping costs down too. Hope I blazed through that fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's it, James? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. You know, you, what you're reminding me of is uh, there was a famous psychologist, uh, James Maslow, and he structured a, a hierarchy of needs. And at the very bottom was the need for shelter and i think you're kind of turning this around and you're saying before you need shelter you need a sense of community because a lot of these people are coming from very insecure very unstable environments and you're providing stability a sense of community and security first you take care of that and then you take care of the the housing that's a, that's a very remarkable uh, concept but I think it makes uh, to total sense to me. And, and you know, having that community has actually been a benefit. Uh, you know, a lot of times when people, you know, develop projects like this, they don't have the input of, you know, the community, they don't know how people are going to use it. So, you know, we're able mm -hmm. to, to tap that resource and, you know, see how they've been living and how they're going to use it and, you know, actually design and develop, uh, you know, yeah. for, for that, you know. I think what I love about what um, James is saying is that the values that the community, the experience of community creates is actually what creates a healthy community period, you know, and, and the possibility of people really living together well. Because, you know, if you don't have um, this mutual commitment, you know, because I think our, our communities, um, you know, some of the ways that people in um, uh, the United States grows uh, you know, you're always thinking about what you want, you know, as an individual. So there's a real strong individualism that, you know, basically um, creates this need for your own 
or that, or like you were talking about how an extra space for your house, when actually, you know, there's so many things that can be shared, you know, um, if people, like if you look in all of our garages, you know, and how we have all these tools, it's like usually you can share those things, you know, with your neighbors. And I think when we can discover that kind of um, sharing um, and, and mutualism, I think that we're better for it. And I think that's a big part of what Aloha is anyway, you know, and I think we're trying to reclaim that these days, you know, in Hawaii also. And, you know, that brings up another takeaway that I'm getting from this. You are not just providing shelter, not just providing community for people, but you are training them for life. You are training them to be responsible citizens and to give. And get, giving is a lot more gratifying than, than taking. And, yeah, and just like and providing you know, that kind of structure. Right. So what James was talking about, how they require um, a certain amount of um, you know, hours of work that everybody has, Kuliana, everybody has their role. I think it's really important. It gives people a sense of pride. It gives people a sense of belonging, you know, when you're a part of a community that way. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was really impressed by James's description of the residents going out to other houseless areas and saying, how can we help you here have some stuff? These are not rich people at all. That they they want to give. You know, a lot of that work has really been you know um, led by this the group uh, Huyaloha, and what they've been doing is kind of you know trying to take notes from Twinkle and see what she's done, and you know going out and you know trying to I wouldn't say replicating you know but kind of share that vision and you know the idea right and getting communities together. Uh, you know, typically you know like they they like to do you know, sweeps and stuff, which really uh, scatter everybody all over the place. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and this idea is, you know, so like, say if you, yeah, you dropped a bunch of rice on the table, right? And, you know, if, if you wanted to take care of it, you, you kind of, you know, scoop it up and, and you take care of it. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, good analogy. Yeah. What, yeah. What, what you don't do is blow it all over the table and then pick it up one by one. You know what I mean? <laughs> So, um, you know, it's, it's really been trying to, you know, build these communities and they, I think they've been really, you know, really successful. Some of the folks from, you know, Kaka'ako have ended up uh, at Hale Moleola, you know, super grateful that, um, you know, Kani, Kani really went over backwards, you know, trying to, trying to make that happen. And, um, you know, even, you know, folks in Waimanalo, um, you know, and they're working with, you know, people at Cream Park, you know, it's, you, you can take care of your area, um, you know, even even if you don't have houses, you know you can still hold Kuleana. Like Waimanalo Beach Park, the folks have you know started cleaning up, um, you know the, the the beach park and stuff like that, and kind of really taking it on, on themselves. So they go, oh, you know, like hey, you know, we live here, you know, we need we need to take care of it, um, you know, and, and then also you know just sharing that, you know, look at where this house's community has gone, you know, if you guys just you know get together. There is some Kuleana, you know, get together and form this community. You guys can get to get further, uh, you know, together than you can individually, right? Hmm. And, you know, I think the latest statistic I saw with regard to houseless was an estimate, I believe this is statewide, of around 4,000 individuals. And you're talking about housing 150 people here, 250 people there. You're taking a big bite out of that existing community. So the end is in sight. You know, we build several more of these shelters and people are no longer needing to be uh, homeless. But remember, Howard, those numbers are not static. You know, and there are people that are really threatened with homelessness because of the way that our, well, the way that our economy is right now, but even before mm -hmm. COVID, you know, um, people are really struggling. You know, they, they don't make enough money, you know, to be able to pay for, the traditional kinds of housing that is available. I think, you know, um, I, I love that you, you know, as part of the, um, the building council has really um, tried to have us start talking more about these tiny homes, really see the value, you know, of these as um, alternative ways of living together. And James, you know, is doing it. You know, I mean, I feel like they're really rocking it out there. In yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I um, think, we can definitely help each other. Um, as James was saying, you know, um, hui aloha, 
I've worked a lot with um, them out there. I've also worked with us at Halemaliola. I think we're all learning from each other, which is really, you know, the way it's supposed to be, I think. Beautiful. You know, we've only got about a minute left and something I really want to point out is that this program is being recorded and Haley, our logistics person, will be putting this, will be archiving this so that this is uh, accessible. And are you, both of your people's uh, email address or phone numbers on the slides? Uh, no, I don't believe so, but you can put it out there. <laughs> 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 so if anybody, you know, um, wants to reach me, you know, they can reach me at Connie M at IHSHawaii.org and James. Yeah, um, we have our website on the on the slides is the www.alohalivesheer.org, and that's really our fundraising website. But it's also got the uh, you know contact. Uh, I think there's a contact form on there as well. So if you know if people want to get in touch with us or whatever, they can fill it out there. Or you know, I'm James Pakeli at dcshawaii.org. So uh, can you repeat that more slowly, James? <laughs> James Pakeli at dcshawaii.org. Yeah. Okay and you would like to be uh, contacted. I'm sure there's many people who are incredibly impressed with, with your work here. And see, uh, this, is, this gives us a real ray of hope. So I believe our time is up and I want to thank James and Connie so much and thank you for the wonderful, wonderful work you're doing and keep it up and I hope this program results in more support for you. So with that cheery note, that very, very cheery and hopeful note, I say goodbye for Think Tech Hawaii, Howard Wig. See you soon. And again, thank you so much, Connie and James. Mahalo. Mahalo.